Okay, Willardale Baptist Church. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with just, you know, um, just, just meeting together and, and encouraging one another. Isn't it, isn't it amazing and awesome that we have the opportunity to do that um, today? And uh, again, I just want to thank uh, Lolly, or as I call her, Mom, for coming up here and singing. And um, uh, just want to thank her again for uh, some of the stuff I'm even going to be teaching today. Uh, a lot of it is taking back authority. Like this is kind of like the mindset that, that we're going to be kind of jumping into today. And so uh, Mom has really helped me do that. So yeah, so we're going to be talking about this um, today. And, uh, and so let's, uh, let's just pray together, um, and then we'll jump into this message. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much, God, for um, this wonderful day, Lord. Thank you, God, for, uh, for just the opportunity to be able to open your word and open the book of Romans, God, and really begin to examine and see um, what these passage of scriptures uh, mean for us, Lord, t- uh, today, God. Lord, and what, like what it means to uh, no longer be condemned, Lord Jesus, uh, but know, Lord, that uh, you died in behalf of our place. And we thank you for that, Lord. And so, God, we just pray, Lord, that your spirit will move in, uh, in power and, 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 uh, and through the word, Lord Jesus, through the administering of the word, God. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, we just uh, have this privilege to, to share um, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have an incredible message for you guys today, and uh, we're going to look through, we're going to be looking at Romans 8, so pull out your Bibles to Romans 8. I'm not going to read the passage in the beginning, uh, but we're just going to be like skipping through it and jumping through it uh, today. But the message that I have for you today is that by faith, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a new creation. So I'm going to ask if you can say this with me. We, or I, let's say I am a new creation. I am a new creation. Declare that over your life because that is the truth. And looking at Romans 7, Henry did an amazing job going through that. Uh, We were talking about this, this inner conflict and this inner war inside of us because of our corrupted bodies of sin. And this constant battle between what we know is right in terms of what we should do, but except we keep falling into sin because we're in this corrupted body. But now we're going to come to Romans 8 and Paul is going to really bring this to the climax here of what it means to be a new creation. What it means uh, for Jesus to do the work for us, our part in that. And what does it mean to have the spirit of God living inside of us, what it means to be called his beloved. So today we're going to look at what does it mean to be called a new creation? What does it mean to, to be this Um, to be completely transformed. And so my first point today is that we can be encouraged that Jesus is the master over sin. Amen? Jesus is the master over sin. I want us to take a little uh, trip back to the book of Genesis and read from this verse because uh, it really reminds me uh, about what Paul is talking about here. We're going to look at the story of Cain and Abel. And so um, this happens in Genesis 4. I'm just going to read a quick verse from that. You don't have to flip back if if you don't want to, but this is what we're going to kind of look at because I believe what God told Cain really kind of resonates with us sometimes when we're talking about this inner battle and this inner conflict. This is what the Lord says to Cain when he wants to kill his brother. He says to him, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, but you must rule over it. Some other translations say, you must master it. And see, what Cain wants to kill Abel, it feels like it's the right thing to do. It feels like, you know, finally my anger will subside if I kill my brother. And this is what sin does to us. Sometimes we might feel angry. Sometimes it might feel like it's the right thing to do. It might feel like it's right to... um, 
to get angry at this person. It might feel like it's right to lie in this certain situation at work because I know it's going to get me out of uh, something that might happen that's worse. Um, it might feel right to do that. It might even feel right to slander against somebody else, even though I want to do that, even though that's something that's inside of me that is wanting me to do that. Um, we know that we shouldn't do it, right? Even if it feels like it's right to do, it's sometimes it's not. But here's the encouraging news. What Cain was unable to do, what we are unable to do, Jesus did for Cain and he did for us. Let's look at Romans 8 today. Romans 1 tells us, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the, the, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free. Say this with me. I am set free. Amen. I am set free. And what are we set free from? We're set free from sin and death. This is what it says in the scripture. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. How are you set free? Because the work of Jesus Christ, because the righteous requirement of the law was met in Jesus who knew no sin. And that says that in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, what the righteous requirement of the law was, it was met in Jesus who lived the perfect life, who was the master over this corrupted sinful body that was subject to death. And so he gave himself as an offering to take the condemnation that was set for us. Therefore, those who are in Christ Jesus do not have to live according to the flesh, but can live according to the Spirit. Which means you don't have to, to submit to sin because Jesus submitted to the will of the Father and took upon himself our sin so we could be set free. Say it one more time with me, church. I am set free. Let's continue into Romans 8. Now it goes on to say, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set. set second point today is set your minds on the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Now to fully understand what Paul is trying to say here is we need to look at the Greek version of the text of what this word mindset really means. And so, uh, some translations call this, uh, this word of the intent. Those who live according to the flesh uh, have, have this intent in their mind on what the flesh desires. But really what this Greek word means is it, it, it's a word uh, and it says it means, uh, uh, it's, it's translated as phreneo. Phreneo. And what it means uh, in the clue to this is that it means to exercise the mind to entertain the mind or to be in the same, or to be of the same mind in an agreement. I'm gonna say that again. It means to exercise the mind, to entertain something in your mind, or to be of the same mind in an agreement. So going back um, to Romans 8, those who have their mind set are exercising their mind, are entertaining their mind, on the flesh. And often, isn't what is produced in our actions come from thoughts that originally came from our minds? Yet for those thoughts to even be entertained in the first place, we had to be in one accord. We had to be of the same mind with them, which means that for us, for sin to take place in the first place, we had to come into a agreement in our minds.
And often, this is even how we understand the world and ourselves, is that sometimes we can come into an agreement with these thoughts. If you're a Christian, you had to come into an agreement that Jesus really is the Son of God, that he rescued you from sin, that if you're pro-life, it's because you believe uh, you had to come into an agreement that abortion is wrong. And a more lighthearted topic, um, I like the Toronto Maple Leafs. So the reason why I like them and the reason why, uh, even if they don't win the Stanley Cup or if they do, and the reason why I cheer for them is because I had to come into an agreement that I'm not going to switch any sports teams. This is my team and I'm going to be loyal to them even if they don't win. So when we're talking about having this mindset or entertaining the mind of the flesh, it means you have entertained this thought and then you have come into an agreement with it. And if you become easily, so if you become easily angry at someone, it's because this thought was entertained in your mind and then you came into an agreement to get angry with them. If you looked at a woman lustfully that is not your wife, it's because you entertained this thought in your mind and then you had to come into an agreement with it that you would do it. If you got drunk or got high that one night, it's because you entertained this in your mind and then you came into an agreement with it and then it happened, right? If you watched that TV show that you know you probably shouldn't have watched, it's because you came into an agreement with it. All of these things. And here's the trippy part of it. We might not even feel like what we're doing was wrong. Like going back to the story of Cain. I'm sure Cain felt justified when he killed his brother Abel. So we need to be so aware of these things. And I talked about obvious sins here. Um, uh, and this even comes down to how, but this can come down to how we perceive God, ourself, and others. If we come into an agreement that God withholds good from us or doesn't give us something good or that he decides to um, take something away and we, we're constantly living in this fear, then whatever God wants to bless us with, we might be afraid that he might eventually take it away. And it's because we came into an agreement with that in our mind. And this, as a result, might be the reason uh, and might actually, actually kind of can shape our view of God in a way um, because we come into an agreement with these things about how we view God, about how we view ourselves, and about how we view others. If you come into an agreement with your mind that you're just not able to do things, that you have this, this mindset of limitation, that because other people have said something to you, because other people have um, uh, made you think a certain way, and you come into an agreement with that in your mind, right? You might have this mindset of limitation. So now it's really interesting as well to go on to talk about this is that there's something we need to understand about spiritual warfare here when we're talking about this word for nail. And this is what it is. And it's used in the New Testament uh, actually when Jesus tells Satan to get behind him when he's talking with Peter. So in chapter uh, 16, uh, when Jesus turns to Peter, he says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. This is what I'm trying to say. Sometimes Satan attacks our minds, and he tells us lies. And the reason why we believe them is because we come into an agreement with those lies. He might even plan situations and traumas in our life, and because of that, we actually believe the lies rather than the truth that God has for us. We have to come into an agreement with a lie for us to be able to believe it. But here's a really encouraging news. What does Paul say in response to these things according to Romans 8? He doesn't end there. He doesn't just say, okay, uh, we, have this, we have this inner battle. We have this inner struggle. We come into agreement with these things, right? He's telling us, uh, he says, you, he says, this mindset of the flesh does not own you. It doesn't own you. 
What Paul says in response to these things, he doesn't end there, but he talks about a mindset of the Spirit, having an exercised mind that entertains the things of the Spirit, that comes into agreement with what the Holy Spirit says over your life, that comes to an agreement over these things. You can declare life and peace over you. This is what he says. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. So Paul says you're not in the realm of the flesh because Christ lives in you. So the same Lord that finished the work for us, who was crucified because of sin, who gives us the Holy Spirit because of righteousness that is by faith. Therefore, when someone who gives their life to the Lord, when they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they become a new creation and the Holy Spirit enters their life. And when the Holy Spirit comes into a person, they receive a new identity. So this mindset that we have, these thoughts that we have in our mind, these things that we've come into agreement with, even these things that we might even be struggling with that we're like, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this, right? We are not of this realm. We are actually, point number three, children of God. Let's say this together. I am a child of God. Amen. Paul talks about how the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Or in other translations, even goes to mention this word hatred or enmity towards God. And it is very clear that those who are in this realm will die. But we who are not in the realm, we have another obligation, which is what Paul says. And it is not to the flesh to live according to it, but it is... And the reason why is because we don't owe this corrupt, sinful nature that is subject to death, that is going to hell anything. We don't, like, not go to hell, but we don't own this body that's dead anything because of the Holy Spirit who has given us life. And Paul will go on to say that the Spirit becomes a testimony. So the Holy Spirit living inside of us, even though we have this corrupt body, even though we feel these ways, it actually bears witness to our spirit inside of us that we are no longer slaves, but that we are sons and daughters. So this mindset that the devil is trying to get you to live in, that he's trying to get you to feel like you're, you are this certain way, that, that maybe you can't do this certain thing, or you're really struggling with this, whatever this mindset is, the Holy Spirit bears witness. And he says, actually, <laughs> We don't have to be in that realm. We are not in that realm. I have the mindset of Jesus Christ. I have the mindset of the Holy Spirit. I have the mindset of whatever God wills in heaven will happen. I have the mindset according to his will, according to his purpose in my life. I don't have to live according to that way anymore. I have a different mindset. So what Paul is saying is that we don't owe this anything. This is what the scripture says, continuing in Romans 8. For those who are led, or I like this word, brought by the Spirit. So it's not just like, I, I, I always read this verse thinking like, hey, I'm led because I'm being, I'm like the Holy Spirit is leading me and I, I have to try and follow what he says. No, he's actually grabbing me and he's bringing me along. That's what that means. Those who are brought by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you should live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are God's children, then what? We are heirs, and we are heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So we are no longer slaves to fear, but the Spirit is a 
seal of adoption, making us sons and children of God, just as Jesus is. Meaning again, we don't have to go back to those mindsets. We don't have to go back to that place of fear. We don't have to accept whatever that person way long ago, like seven years ago said to us that hurt us, that we don't even fully realize in our subconscious mind, but it keeps coming up to us and we keep walking in fear because of it. We don't have to go back to that mindset. That mindset is not who we are. But we have a heavenly father and we are declared as God's children. This word Abba in the scripture, what this word means, and I love it. Let's slow it down, but I love it. And this word Abba father is the word Jesus used when he was in the garden of Gethsemane. That's the only other time it's actually, actually no, I don't know if it's the only other time used in scripture, but I know for sure in the New Testament, it's the first time it's used. And Jesus is an Aram, is, um, he doesn't speak Greek. You know, he speaks Aramaic. So why in the world is he using this Greek term, right? Like, why is he saying this? Why does, uh, I think it's in the Gospel of Mark, why does Mark uh, point this out? It's because, like, Jesus, in his moment of suffering, in his moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's awaiting for the sins of the whole world to fall on him, he still has his Father in perspective. He still knows that he is a child of God. He still believes in what the Father can do over his situation. He knows he's going to go to the cross, but what he sees is not the cross. He sees what happens after it. That's what he sees. He has this mindset. He's come into an agreement with the will of God. This is what he says when he's in the garden. Not what I will, but what you will. He has come into an agreement with the will of God. And I love and I love this connection Paul is using because it shows when we are in our most difficult trial, we can come into an agreement with the will of God. That it might not make any sense to us, but we can come into an agreement with the will of God because we are God's children, because we don't have this agreement of the mindset where we're living in this other way. We don't have this flesh really way that we're living in, but we're living according to the spirit who is bringing us to the Father. So next time you're afraid, next time you're tempted to come into an agreement with sin, remember Jesus as your example, that he saw the glory that would await him and all that we brought in after him. And notice, again, the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit, which I like this because sometimes we feel like our Heavenly Father needs to be reminded that we're his child. Like, sometimes we actually feel this way. Like, God, you know, like, you got to be reminded that uh, I, I'm still your child over here, you know. Um, and sometimes we feel this way uh, because we feel like sometimes God forgot about us, right? And these are just legit feelings that we sometimes experience. That's what I'm just saying. Like, that's all I'm saying right now. But I love this because it, it reminds us that, you know, like, God hasn't forgot about us because the Holy Spirit is the testimony to us, like the Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to the Father and is in, he's interceding on behalf of us, right? This is what it says. And so the triune God became on mission through the Holy Spirit to deliver you out of fear and to make you a daughter and a son of the Most High God. And what happens when you become a son or a daughter to the Father, to the creator of the cosmos, you don't just become a son or a daughter, but you become, one sec. <laughs> You become, you don't just become a son, you don't just become a daughter, but you become royalty. This is what Paul says. He says, now if we are children, then we are heirs. So it's not just a son and a daughter. No, you are a son and a daughter of the king. You are a son and a daughter of the creator of the cosmos, and you are his royalty, an adopted son, an adopted daughter. But you're going to say to me, Matthew, you, know, you say I'm royalty and all these things, but look around me in the world, and how can you kind of say this? Paul even has an answer for that. So my first point is God has a purpose for my life. Let's declare this together. God has a purpose for my life. Amen. 
He has a purpose for my life too. I consider, this is what Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. What is Paul teaching us here? That our full adoption as sons and daughters is a concept of status. Our sonship and our daughterhood is a restoration to what the created order was supposed to be. Because Paul makes it clear that the creator order was subjected. It was given a lesser rank. That's what that word means in Greek. Subjected means it was given a lesser rank. In the same way that death came upon Adam and Eve, the entire created order also felt the consequences of the curse, which goes to tell us how God views authority. It was based on what? The will of Adam and Eve and their decision, whether they knew the full consequences or not of their actions, to bring everything that they, uh, to bring everything that they had rulership over into death and decay. And this teaches us the consequences of sin, the destructiveness of sin, and how it doesn't just impact us, but it impacts everything else and everyone around us. <laughs> and what's interesting is that when Adam and Eve sin, they start blaming each other, and then they start blaming Satan, being the like, oh, well, well Satan, you know, he was the one who kind of, you know, like, he's kind of, he's kind of the one who did this, right? But God wants us to take consequences for our sin. He wants us to take responsibility um, for the things that we do. And uh, not, to take, not to take the consequences of our sin because Jesus has taken it, but he wants us to take responsibility when we do wrong things. And I think the scripture uh, clearly represents this. So, this teaches us the consequences of sin, the destructiveness of sin. So what this means is that a foolish thought or an unwise action has powerful consequences. Any sort of sin that happens has powerful consequences that could destroy or delay the good that God has even set in store for us. And we see this, uh, what, we see this in the scripture. So the next time we think about even just saying a little lie to our parents so we don't get in trouble. Or the next time we think about saying foolish words, even if you really think that you're right. Or next time, you know, you're tempted to look at someone lustfully. Or next time you're thinking of slandering someone else or watching that TV show or movie or listening to that song or playing that video game, you know you probably shouldn't play or do. Think about the consequences. Now there's something really important we need to unmask here. And it's that every time we disobey God, we are opening a door to the devil. We are coming into an agreement with Satan. And going back to the fall of mankind, Adam and Eve had come into an agreement with the serpent. And you might ask me, well, how? Like, how is this possible? Well, it's because they were doing the will of Satan and not the will of God. Because God told them not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he explained to them the consequences that would happen that they would die. However, Satan shows up and lies to them and they believed in what he said rather than what God said, which means that they didn't uh, go, they didn't, um, they didn't believe or trust in the will of God, but actually they were believing or trusting in the will of Satan. And so what happens here is Paul actually says in Romans 1, that when the fall happened, there was an exchange in glory. He tells us that what took place is that the sons and daughters um, of God had now fallen from the glorified state. And Paul goes on to write in Romans 8, <clears throat> verses 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. 
Not only so, but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we, excuse me, but we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So yes, the creation has been groaning. Yes, the fall of mankind has happened, but we have a hope. We have a hope because we know the Holy Spirit is the sign of the first fruits in us or the beginning, the download, the down deposit of a new creation. The evidence of that is in the Holy Spirit. And I was just thinking about this. What happens if we presented the gospel this way to people? Like just doing evangelism and talking to people. Like what happens? Because like look, looking at this scripture, Paul says, and he's talking about this hope of us becoming a new creation and receiving the Holy Spirit. And he says that it is in this hope we are saved. What happens if this was the way in which we evangelize to people? Like we were to tell them, you actually are a new, you could become a new creation right? Like God doesn't want you to live in this way anymore. He doesn't want you to have this mindset anymore. You don't even realize what your life is like right now, but you can become a new creation because of what Jesus did for you. Wouldn't that change the way of evangelism? Like if we just showed up to people and told them this, because I don't know, for me, that brings me so much joy when I realize that I am a new creation, that I have the Holy Spirit, literally who created the entire cosmos living inside of me, purging me of sin, seeing everything that's set up here and kicking it down and being like, listen, I'm setting up my shop here because this is how I want to work. Matthew, I want you to come against, I want you to come over my will. I don't want you to go over the will of the enemy anymore. I don't want you to be under that. I want you to be under this will because I have a good plan for your life. When I know that, when we have this hope, it's our obligation to share it. And so that was just something I just kind of wanted to, to talk about because I think it's interesting um, and in how we do evangelism and stuff. Maybe this is a way that we can come about talking about, hey, you're a new creation. You don't have to live this way any longer. The way that God sees you, he sees you as a son and a daughter who is lost and he wants you to be found. And that's how Jesus saw the people who he's inter engaging with. So now we're looking at verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Amen. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans, and he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the purpose, God works for the good of those who love him, who, what is our point? Who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So, Whatever we might be struggling with in terms of our weakness, sometimes we don't even know what, we ought, what we've ought to groan for. Maybe some of us are really struggling with something. We've been praying for something for so long, for something to break in our lives, for to see breakthrough happen. We can know that the Spirit intercedes for us even through wordless groans, even through our crying out to God, even through um, our suffering. He is the one who intercedes for us and He searches and he knows, uh, and he who searches our hearts knows the minds of the Spirit. So we can be encouraged by that. But I want to also mention here, again, Paul is talking about wills. Because this is really important because when we're talking about wills, we're talking about coming into an agreement with something. So again, Paul here is talking about the will. Through the will of Adam, the world was brought into decay. But now, through the inner work of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit intercedes for us to do the will of God. And we can trust in God's will. We can trust that His authority as our loving Heavenly Father um, is the best for us because He knows what's best. 
and he has a glorious purpose for us. See, God ain't out here to cheat us or deprive us of any type of good. And even uh, because of circumstances that might have happened in our lives where we actually blame God for something, we might actually believe that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about uh, this later on um, in a demonstration I'm going to give, but we might believe that God's kind of like cheated us or deprived us of good. But the truth is, is that what does God, what does the scripture say in Romans 8, 31? What then, um, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave himself up for us all, how will he not also along with him, what? Graciously give us all things. See, God is someone who gives. He's someone who loves to give. He's someone who loves to give us the good things, the purposes that he has for us. God isn't here to deprive us of good, but rather he wants to give us all things because that's what the creator of the universe does. That's what the king of the universe does to for his children because we are his heirs. So now, coming to the conclusion and to the epic climax of Romans 8. Who then will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, who was condemned, and more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he's also interceding for us. So the Holy Spirit intercedes for you, but also Jesus Christ, his blood, his sacrifice before the heavenly courts is interceding for us. He's interceding for us. So the question kind of remains to us, who brings these charges against us? Who brings these charges against the ones whom God has chosen? Because God makes it clear in the scripture, it's not him. He's not the one who condemns us because Christ was raised to life. So then we have to ask ourselves the question, who then condemns us? Is it the devil? Is it demons? Who is the one who condemns? Because we know there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We know that. So even when the enemy tries to condemn you about something you did like eight years ago, and it's like complete nonsense, but he's still trying to get you to like be condemned because of something that you did, you can say, well, actually, I'm not condemned because this is what the scripture says because the blood sacrifice of Jesus is in the heavenly courts and is interceding on behalf of me. I am covered underneath the blood of Jesus. I am a new creation. I don't belong to that way anymore. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have authority over my life any longer. And this is what the scripture says. When it talks about being more than conquerors, woo, I love it. This is what it says when it says to be more than a conqueror. The translation means we will completely prevail. So it's not like, oh, you know, I'm conquering in this battle and I might win this one battle. No, you win every single battle. The, what happened at the cross, what happened at Calvary, Jesus Christ, when he was crucified, when his blood was spilled, whatever the devil was waving around um, at God, being like, well, these people did this. These people are sinners. I'm sorry. We're covered underneath the blood of Jesus. So whatever work the devil tried to do, the scripture tells us that Jesus Christ came to do spiritual warfare. He came to destroy the devil's work. That's what it says in 1 John. And this is what it says, that we are more than conquerors and because of his sacrifice, we will completely prevail. This is why Jesus says in Luke 10, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions because Jesus has given us this authority because we are a new creation. And so I am now convinced that neither death nor life, that neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I want us to take a quick note actually on this word um, because this word demons that it talks about in the scripture, it actually isn't the word demon. Um, it's the word arche, which means ruler. However, our Bibles translate this 
as uh, an evil spirit. So you might be wondering, how was that possible? Well, actually, in Scripture, this word, um, this word arche is translated as someone who's rulership, someone who has authority. Uh, another word for it is principality. And so um, why do the Bibles translate this? Well, Ephesians and the Scriptures talk a lot about um, this idea that the enemy or the devil is the god of this world, and that those who follow him, whether knowingly or unknowingly, are a son of disobedience, meaning that they're coming under the dominion of Satan. And the reason why I'm saying this is because we need to be aware of our adversary. Yes, we've won the victory. Yes, because of Jesus Christ, we can trample on snakes and scorpions. But we have to be aware that we are still in a spiritual battle. And for us to sleep on that is to allow the enemy full havoc in our life. This is what it says. Um, and this is what Jesus actually says. He says, the devil comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come that we may have life. The, uh, uh, Jesus calls him the father of lies, the most, most crafty creature in the entire cosmos. So he can even disguise himself as an angel of light. So I'm saying these things, we need to be aware. And in, in that way, we need to be aware, but we also need to be aware that we have authority over him. We have authority over him because the enemy will make us think that we don't, but we do. Because we are a new creation, because we are not in the realm that was dead and we do not walk in this way any longer. We don't have to come under these mindsets. We don't have to come into these agreements with sin and with lies and with things that we have been told, whether by someone else, uh, whether by the enemy, um, whatever, or even lies that we've just believed about ourselves. We don't have to come into an agreement any longer. We have authority over our mind and over our body. And so I have a little demonstration that I want to give today to kind of talk about uh, just to kind of, it's actually my personal testimony um, about how I'm even learning myself what it means to take back authority over my life. And I think this is, uh, I think this is going to help because I think sometimes we don't fully recognize how much strongholds that are kind of in our minds and that are over us. And so today, I'm just going to grab this table here. I'll be right back. Today, I'm just going to put on a little, uh, I think it's called a skit or something. But um, it's a testimony. And it's my personal testimony about things that I believed in my life. And then when I came to the realization that I actually don't have to come into an agreement with those things any longer. And so uh, this is uh, the reason why I'm wearing black today um, is because, uh, actually, no, sorry. These cups represent the building blocks of my mind. So these represent ideas. They represent thoughts. They represent things um, that I think. And they represent lies that the enemy has told me about myself. So I don't know if you're aware of this. But um, when I was seven years old, I was sexually assaulted. And it was something that really affected me. Okay, <laughs> like it really affected me. And I didn't realize how much that actually took hold of my life until three months ago. Because the devil walked into my life, took something of most valuable, precious to me. He took something that had incredible value to me. And I didn't realize it because I was sleeping. Because I was sleeping on this thing, this issue that I've been dealing with for like... Uh, when did that happen? 15 years ago, right? I'm still, I was still dealing with it and I didn't see. So this is what I'm saying. I was sexually assaulted. And um, also, I'm also going to pretend to be an evil spirit. So it's gonna be really interesting, but I'm just, the reason why is to kind of show how the devil lies to us and how he builds up these strongholds in our mind, okay? So this is why I'm wearing black. Okay, so. Um, Matthew has some really big problems with, uh, with um, his self-image. So let's actually plan and orchestrate this event where he um, is sexually assaulted. And um, this is something that is just gonna cause a lot of trauma for him. Um, and he's, he's, uh, he's really going to start to begin to actually think that it was his fault. Matthew, 
this is your fault. It was your fault that you were assaulted. You know, you actually kind of wanted it in a way. You know that? Yeah, you kind of wanted it. Yeah, yeah. You know, this, is, this, is, this, was, this was your fault. Oh, I know like you're really angry. You should probably get justice back at this person, right? Like your anger is totally um, and, 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 and completely uh, justified. However, you have a problem with anger. You have this huge problem with anger, um, and it's something that you can't really ever escape. It's not something that you will ever be able to get free from because this person did this to you, and I want you to hold bitterness towards this person. Oh, I know that, Matthew, like, you're really kind of struggling with this uh, right now, and you're really kind of going back to this event, but uh, I want to plant, in the, plant um, this into your life. I want to plant uh, this problem of uh, sexual sin uh, into your life. And I, I want you to think that this is uh, a way in which you should go, you know, that maybe this is a way for you to kind of uh, connect back to that past event. Because the last lie is that this thing that happened to you actually kind of defines you. This is who you are. You're actually a son of darkness. Now you call yourself a Christian, but actually you are not what really you say you are. And if people really saw you for who you are, then they would be disgusting. So all of these lies are set up, but then it keeps going. Uh, so with all these problems with sexual sin and all these problems with anger, I'm going to introduce pornography into his life right now. You know, like this is something we're going to introduce because we know that once he falls into this, then whoever the person God has for him, this is going to cause actual problems in the relationship because we don't want him to actually uh, succeed or do well. Oh, this problem that he has about him thinking it, that it's his fault, uh, let's actually just kind of twist this a little bit and make it seem that it's his fault, so everything is his fault. Everything that happens in his life is his fault. So what can we also bring into that equation? Hmm, let's see. Uh, well, uh, maybe life isn't just worth living anymore. Oh, your mom. Let's make his mom get really sick so that he believes this. Oh, well, what do we have over here? Hmm, let's see. Uh, you know, he, he really kind of believes this about himself and his mom is, is really sick. And let's bring a really toxic relationship into his life. Someone who's just going to completely tear him down. Because we know that uh, this is actually going to affect how he views himself. So let's bring this toxic relationship into his life when he's young. And make him think that's all, he, uh, make him think that's all that ever really love is. Okay. Okay. All right. So now let's introduce this, uh, this character of the Joker. Let's introduce this, this psychotic clown and let's make him think that uh, he actually is part of this identity. Let's actually make him come and grab, grapple onto this type of identity. Okay, well, we got a little, little tower here. And, all right, and last but not least, let's actually try to get him to believe that, um, you know, that because of all of these things that happened to him, because of all of this foundation, Let's get him to believe that he actually probably should just kill himself, you know? Let's actually get him to believe it. And I was stepping out of this situation. I tried to kill myself. I did. But God stepped into the situation and saved me. And I'm so thankful for that. But I give this as a, uh, as a demonstration to how the devil lies to us about things. But here is the encouraging thing. We don't have to come into an agreement anymore, right? Because we're sons of righteousness. We don't have to come into an agreement with these lies any longer. So we can say, we can say to these events that happened to us, I want to uh, teach us something. We can repent from the things that happened to us because we know when we ask for forgiveness for something, uh, you know, like uh, we ask for forgiveness for a specific type of sin or whatever, um, this word repentance actually means, because uh, we, we talked about this in my sermon, um, my sermon uh, that was in, um, in February, we talked about this. We talked about what it means, the word repentance. The word repentance actually means to change, like to turn away. So you say, I repent. Uh, so an example we would see, let's say I have a problem with anger. I repent for ever being angry. I renounce that action in the name of Jesus and I release myself from it once and for all time and I nail it to the cross of Jesus Christ who was sacrificed on my behalf. That's what we can say. 
I repent, I renounce, and I release. So coming up to this, this, this thing, I have authority in Jesus Christ. I have authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to come against um, the power of the enemy. That's what it tells me in scripture. So I'm sorry, but I am a new creation. Oh, Matthew, you know, like, uh, you still don't believe that you love yourself. I bind you. I am a new creation. Oh, Matthew, you know, um, you, uh, you still kind of, you're still kind of struggling um, with, this, uh, with this problem of anger. You're still really angry at this person. I bind you. I am a new creation. We have to take back our authority. And so this is our encouragement today, is that we are new creations. And the crazy thing is, is that, I actually didn't get to do this yet. I'd be lying if I said I didn't buy this yesterday because I did. Um, straight up, like, I'm going to take this off too. Here's the crazy thing that uh, I think will kind of demonstrate this well. And then I'll finish, I promise. Um, but this is that at the age of four, I was a new creation. I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit was at work inside of me. He was at work. That's what it was. And I wasn't just a new creation, right? I wasn't just this, this thing, this, this, like, I was a new creation. I was decked out. I became his heir, right? However, <laughs> however, because I didn't understand spiritual warfare, because I had come into an agreement with these things in my mind, I had let this stronghold build up. And I'm telling you today, I always had the authority to take it down. I always had the authority in the name of Jesus Christ to take it down. And so do you. You have the authority in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we praise you and we thank you so much for this sermon today. Lord, we thank you, God, that we are new creations. Lord, we pray, God, that you would break down these strongholds in our minds, that you would actually bring to the surface the lies of the enemy, God, so that we may be able to repent from them, renounce them, release them, reject them, bind them, because we know that it says we can take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Lord, we thank you for that, Lord. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we would go in your power and in your authority, Lord, and that we would know that your Holy Spirit is bringing us to the Father. Lord, I pray, God, that you would cement in our minds the mindset of Christ, cement in our minds that we are a new creation, that we no longer live to those ways any longer, that we don't have to come into an agreement any longer with sin, but rather we can come into an agreement with the will of the Father. So I pray, Lord Jesus, we be reminded that we are sons and daughters of the King, and not only be reminded of that, but to share this truth with other people in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Wow. <laughs> that, was a, that was a treat for us today, right? Yeah. Visually, we came to uh, understand. Amen. Uh, so let's rise for our last song. We're living in, in beautiful times. We see the Lord working uh, in different parts of the planet. The Lord is always at work. And he's building his church. Amen. So we're going to sing like the days of Elijah. Do you know the song? Days of Elijah? Huh? If you know, please let's sing together.